I'm Michael Goldman. Welcome to another podcast from the front lines, where each month we talk with filmmakers from various disciplines about their work on current major feature films. This month, our guest is veteran production designer Paul Osterberry to discuss his design work on Guillermo del Toro's new critically acclaimed film, The Shape of Water, the Cold War romantic drama about a mute woman discovering the government's biggest secret. It's captured an amphibian-like man-creature and is experimenting on him, only to fall in love with the fish man, relies heavily on production design elements, from the woman's apartment to the secret government facility where the creature is kept, and a whole lot more. We recently caught up with Osterberry to explain these design challenges and how they were executed. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Paul, thanks a lot for joining us. Appreciate it. Likewise. And I thought, you know, before um, we get into some specific stuff, uh, I, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, you'd ever worked uh, with director Guillermo de Toro before this project? Um, I worked with him actually uh, the summer of 2015. I was working for about eight weeks. Uh, Dan Lauston, the DP, and myself were working, prepping uh, Pacific Rim 2. Mm -hmm. We were scouting in China a few times, and, uh, and it was at that time when he, I heard mention of this, this fish, untitled fish movie. Um, Dan had talked about it actually before Guillermo. He was talking about Guillermo's passion project, this, this small black and white film. Um, and I was a bit terrified by the idea of a black and white film. Intrigued, excited, but also a bit terrified because color is pretty important. Um, as a tool for design and help to tell a story and to have that removed and just use light and dark textures was a little intimidating. Dan was super excited. I was a little uh, skeptical, but uh, thankfully, I think in the end, if, if you've seen the film, I th thankfully, it seems ironic that that was the case because color is quite important in the, in the end uh, result of the film. Indeed, and we're, we are going to get into that. And, and for those who haven't seen it yet, it is not a black and white film in the end. It was discussed to be one at the beginning. You know, so how was it that Guillermo pulled you into it and, and, and why were you attracted to it? You, you just spoke about possibly at the time not having a chance to use color. You know, that's a fearful thing. There's a lot of elements in this that are not orthodox for design and, and other disciplines. You know, what, what attracted you to it? You know, why was it a good fit for, for him and for you to, to bring you on to this? Well, for me, you know, I think any designer would jump for joy and hope to work on a movie by Guillermo del Toro or with Guillermo del Toro because he's such a visual director and has a massive appetite for design, uh, creature design in this particular case plus just the art department itself and so uh, I think I actually had to wait about seven months before we ended up prepping this one and it was well worth the wait. There was no way I was going to potentially be occupied on something else and, and miss a chance to work on a on a passion project by Guillermo del Toro. If I understood right, I was told that he had, um, you know, worked for a couple of years on it, uh, particularly the creature design uh, and some elements of designing the show, you know, of just general themes and things he wanted to evoke. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, he originally conceived it as black and white. You know, maybe you could give us a little backstory, you know, why, first of all, why was it conceived black and white? And then second of all, as you joined the project and um, you know started to get together with them at the at the front end uh, you know had meetings and stuff you know what was the basic mission statement you know how did he put it to you here's what I'm trying to achieve with production design on this movie we didn't talk much about the black you know the notion of black and white because not long after I, I well after I got the script um, Fox Searchlight came on board and, and they offered more money to do it in color so I, I didn't actually get to chat to him much about it I think what he wanted to do is evoke an older style of filmmaking, I think, is what, is what uh, well, you know, Guillermo has this, this passion for and knowledge depth of movie history that, you know, he's got a photographic memory almost. So I think he just wanted to, to evoke some of those, some of the, that period history of, of filmmaking, that black and white time that, that was not done anymore, really, or rarely done anymore. Um, I don't really know. I didn't really get into it because I was, a little, like I said, I was very happy once we got into the color. And he, again, Pulled lots of uh, reference from uh, early colorized films for for us to look at because we wanted to. He, he wanted to evoke this, this same romantic time of uh, cinema, yet in a in a contemporary tale, but told in a period setting. If that kind of makes sense, it was important to him that we set this movie in that time period. It was the time for he said, "Look, this is the time where people now think about America being great again." You know, it was right after the war, everything, people looking forward to science, space races on, you know, there's a Cold War era, um, it was a good time for film noir around, the, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, it was, 
a lot of these Im this a lot of this imagery you want to evoke in this film um, and help help it tell the story that, about these characters and, and just and people uh, uh, I guess just the, the emotion of these people are these outcasts you know he wants to he wants to elevate the outcasts in society during this time we didn't specifically talk about um, the kind of architecture that we're going to be in we have certain things. Gamer had been, like you said, Gamer had been working on the script for a long time. He he lives a lot of the time in Toronto, and so he had written certain sequences for certain buildings in his mind. One of them being where Eliza's apartment is, uh, above this old movie house. Um, there's a building in Toronto called Massey Hall, which is not a movie house. It's a music hall. Um, it doesn't have a marquee. Um, we ended up creating that marquee practically and digitally on the, on the stage, on the, on the location, I should say. He really wanted to use the fire escapes that came down from this, uh, this old building. And we wanted a big contrast between the, the laboratory where she worked and the sort of old romantic notion of, architect, of the architecture of her uh, decrepit, but beautiful apartment steeped in history. And um, for, for those that haven't seen it yet, without giving away the, the really juicy stuff, it is about a it is a Cold War set tale of, of, about a mute woman who um, works in a government installation as, as a cleaning lady, and there discovers a a, a a creature the government is examining, and through some machinations, a love affair ensues, shall we say? And, and so that that was one of the things that got me about the movie. We, we seem to sort of plaster together uh, genres, you know, a, a mystical sort of tale, a fairy tale, a love story, and, and kind of a Cold War thriller aspect. Um, and so it struck me that all those elements had to be addressed in, in, in design. You, you couldn't just address one or the other uh, kind of a thing. And so, you know, as you sit, you, you get the script and you, you've met with him and you kind of get his take. Maybe you could talk us through kind of the um, layman's version of the uh, your design process, you know, where you go from there and, and how you try to match kind of what's floating around in Guillermo's head to what's, you know, feasible to, to do on the screen and, and get it right. Well, essentially the job of a production designer is to help set a story in a place or to help tell the visual story of the, of the movie. Basically, place it's like being an architect and the script is your client, essentially. You're creating rooms for this, the pieces of the story and your rooms have to help tell that story or the director's vision of that story. And, and so when we started with Guillermo, uh, the first thing we did for design was we actually talked about the color, and he he, he came to, to the studio or the office when we first opened it um, and said, "Let's let's pull out all the color palette, color chips from the Benjamin Moore thing, and let's just go through it and we'll assign colors to each character." So we, we, we rapidly went through this three thousand paint chips that uh, Benjamin Moore has, and we uh, <laughs> we settled on about a hundred, and then and then I eventually, you know broke that down to probably about 30 or 40 colors and I put it on a board and alongside with uh, Lewis the costume designer we he had his same color chips for or fabric swatches I should say and we had we, we established sort of the tap the palette of this film basically we associate certain colors for different characters to help associate their spaces to differentiate their spaces from others or give a mood you know um, one one place could be cool more aqua colors for a certain character another place could be warm uh, for empathetic character, we end up going warmer, uh, mustardy brown kind of colors. That's a, a simple way to help uh, shape uh, the mood of a, of a space. Then we have architecture. That's the other design element or the envelope that we're, we're, the scene takes place in. And uh, one of our characters, Eliza, our, our main character, uh, we decided to set it in this romantic 19th century building and we, con we contrasted that heavily with the architecture, this brutalist architecture of, of uh, 1950s and 60s. The, the, archi the, the style of archi architecture can help uh, tell the story. And we have uh, Eliza's character, uh, you know, she's this, uh, she's the mute janitor working, um, working the night shift at this secret underground laboratory, government-run laboratory. And her world that we come from, she, she's, she's a bit of a dreamer. She lives in this festive beautiful fantasy romantic uh, architectural space it's got history it's got it's steeped in history uh, and and then the lab the contrast of that is the lab which is this sort of brutalist architecture we, we chose brutalist architecture um, as a way to to show oppression and cold feeling hard materials that essentially our leading man which is a fish man he's sort of incarcerated in this in this sort of architecture so it was a real contrast in um, environments for the two parts of the, or two characters and the two parts of the story. 
Um, and the brutalist style architecture, it was very common from the 50s, 60s, 70s in institutional architecture. So, and I actually studied architecture, and I was, my schooling was, we were set in a brutalist concrete building. So it was kind of, uh, kind of ironic. And I'll, don't get me wrong, I, I didn't feel like I was oppressed or anything at my, my schooling, but uh, it helped tell the story here. And, and the lab was this, we could, have t- we could have taken the lab to be this sort of sterile, cold, kind of white environment that's kind of typical of a science place. But we, we you know, this is Guillermo del Toro, a very fantastical mind, and we wanted to uh, evoke this sort of humid, steamy environment where this godlike creature was brought from the, the humid Amazon into this environment. We had everything was slicked with water, steam, reflected, rippling light. It was quite a magical place, but a harsh environment. Yeah, and you, uh, you know, I want to kind of dig a little deeper on, on a couple of the environments, but particularly um, Eliza's uh, uh, apartment and that whole building, the movie theater below, um, and it, you know, the, what we saw was uh, light and sound coming up from the movie theater into her place, um, and, and she has a, a neighbor uh, played by Richard Jenkins, who's an artist. And he's got kind of an artist's um, studio kind of feel to his place. And they share a giant window, which is a very cool kind of design. Um, And then the whole color process within, I I mean, uh, maybe you could address that theme as well. You know, um, uh, the movie is called The Shape of Water. Maybe you could explain, you know, why it's called that and, and, and the fact that we almost design or, or, or we almost feel comfortable in her apartment being a place that could um, be a, a an aqua type environment as indeed some scenes um, go there late, you know at some point in the movie yeah the, the opening of the movie I'm not giving anything away because you see it in the, in the trailer um, the opening of the movie uh, you, you start with some fish and it look like you're in, swimming in the bottom of a river and you, you end up going down this sort of flooded flooded sort of fantasy corridor and into this apartment this sort of aqua toned apartment um, that our main character Eliza lives in, and she's, you know, there's furniture floating around, and she's she's floating above, above her uh, uh, her, her chaise or couch, and it all drops down, and an alarm goes off, and it's a bit of a dream, um, and again, that was as if we were in an aquatic environment, but we wanted to keep that that notion of an aquatic environment throughout the movie in her apartment. Her apartment, um, the tones, the color tones of that apartment are all in this sort of blues, aqua, aqua kind of colors. Um, it's it's literally, I, it sounds a little bit uh, corny, but I, I always refer to her apartment as being literally shaped by water. I mean, the title for me ended up shaping her apartment. Um, you mentioned that, that arch window. That, that arch window was uh, a reference from a movie from 1948 named The Red Shoes. There was a, mm. a picture game where I really liked this, you really wanted this window. And the idea that this was a beautiful room built at the, at the end of the last century, or the end of two centuries ago now, I guess, uh, the end of the 19th century, um, that later on in life when it became a movie theater in the uh, in the 20s, it kind of got split down the middle and this this window were kind of crudely cut in half. One side, which becomes our main character, Eliza's apartment, is this sort of aqua blue kind of aqua kind of tones and, and quite devoid of uh, decoration. It's very stark and minimal and, um, and, and much more decrepit. The other side, which is Richard Jenkins' character, or Giles' apartment, it's it's a little bit bigger. He's got this. Uh, he's an illustrator in the, uh, in the advertising uh, industry that kind of had a. His backstory was he, he obviously was more successful when it was all illust- uh, hand drawn illustrations, and now science has taken over, photography has taken over the advertising world, and he's kind of been shunted. He's a bit. He's been left behind a little bit, and he kind of lives in this sort of world that's an older world. He watches old uh, movies with and, and old musicals, and he. he, he He's also an outcast, you know, he's, he's uh, a gay man living in a time where it wasn't very comfortable um, or very easy to be. And so, but he's also this empathetic, warm character, which is, a, and, and, and his apartment is to be a foil from her cool colors. His apartment is supposed to be uh, warm, lit, lit uh, more like daylight colors, and, and definitely much more cluttered. He, his, he's this artistic character with tons of books and, and cats, and, and it's, it's a real, difference from the two apartments. And the idea that Guillermo and I discussed was that, you know, neither of these characters, Liza, who's mute, is not a whole, she's not whole, he's he's feeling an outcast, but together they become a team and they become whole. It's like the, if the windows are joined together and that wall is pulled out, it becomes this grand room again. So that was a little story point that, that was to be helped being told by the design of, of the, the two spaces. Um, there's also some subtleties in her apartment 
I mean, again, I said literally shaped by water. Um, our backstory for this was um, that there was a flood, or sorry, a fire at one point, and, and that side was flooded by obviously the firemen washing it down. And Eliza's side. Eliza's side, yeah. yes. And the, uh, the floorboards warped, buckled, and had to be pulled off. The plaster below in the theater would have fallen off a little bit. And so that allowed us um, to, to contrast that opening sequence where we go down and we're literally underwater, or feel like we're literally underwater. Later in the movie, um, later in our story, you know, we have these scenes where the, the, the light from the theater below are, are, emulated, are, are flickering through the floorboards, much like that caustic light from the water that we had, like from the sun dappling through, through water, um, was in that earlier sequence. We, we, we emulate the same thing, but, but actually by cinema light coming through the floorboards. And there's always this subtle drone of, of sounds coming through the, the, the floor as well uh, in there. And there's other subtleties in, in, this, in this side. You know, uh, I found, our set decorators found this uh, linoleum pattern, vintage linoleum from the 30s that was actually like surface of water, like Brooklyn water, and that's in the kitchen. It's, you know, it's all these subtle things you don't really see. You see it vaguely in the background. There's water dripping through. When it rains, there's, there was about eight or nine leaks that we made dripping all the time, pouring through the, 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 the ceiling. And then there's a, there's a subtle thing that Guillermo had asked for at the very beginning. Um, he brought a reference uh, of a photograph of a woman in India from a photography exhibit. Um, and she's standing in front of this really, really intense blue wall, like an aged, decrepit wall. And he said from the very beginning, you know, Jazz has all the art on the wall, she has none. But the, the art, the wall itself should become the piece of art. And he just left it at that. And I had to think about it for a while. And, I was debating how to interpret my interpretation of what, what would create this, these patterns on the wall and, or what my motive uh, might be or inspiration might be. And at first I thought it might be like a, we, could, we could emulate a river. Like if you're looking at the top of a river and the river's flowing down the wall, you can have the rocks and things being the cracks in the plaster and whatnot, and the rapids being the lighter white plaster and the darker bits being, you know, uh, just in the, in the paint. And then I thought, well, you know, we can... You know, I was just thinking of shapes of water in, in art, and I thought one of the most iconic, famous shapes of, of water that I loved was this uh, great wave of off Kana, uh, uh, Kanagawa, which is done by uh, Hokusai. It's uh, so a woodblock print mm -hmm. from, I think, the 1830s in Japan. And it's if I think if you guys see it, you may not know the title, but if you see it, you'll recognize it, because it's very, very... Um, I even have a T-shirt with it on, for instance. And it's this, this woodcut of this great wave curling over, uh, all about to engulf a boat that's like rushing down to the bottom of the trough of the wave. And so I, I suggested it to Guillermo, I said, you think it's a bit obvious, you know, but I was thinking of using it as a, this, the basis for this art wall, subtle art wall in the background. And he was all over it, he was all for it. So I superimposed this uh, a rendition of this image on top of a computer drawn set. And then my scenic artist, Matthew Lenmark, he, he literally painted that wall and with dimension in plaster. We tinted plaster in blue when we painted, painted the shape of this crashing wave. And I had it so that it, it engulfed the doorway. So anyone coming into this aqua world, when they stepped into that door, if you stood back, you could see this wave about to like soak them into this water world. Um, and then, and at first, Guillermo came to me one day. He said, oh my God, Paul, it's a little literal. It's a little obvious because we were, you know, we'd only just started. And it was, you could see it clear as the day, as, as clear as a bell, but... But once we aged, we put many, many comp complementary layers of paint on top of it, it washed it way back, and it gave this, this, it gave some meaning to this beautiful wall. It had so much texture, but there was actually something subtle in the background. It wasn't meant to hit you over the head with it, but it was one of these little things that you can incorporate into, into the design to help the game with the storytelling. And a lot of these designs and experimenting with them, is it just a question of, you know, finding the materials, finding the props, uh, painting them, playing around, doing photographic tests, uh, or do you do computer design yourself? Do you do sketches? You know, a little of everything. Uh, yes, there are many ways to to, to to work the design process. I mean, Guillermo likes to have a few concept illustrations done early on. Um, Guy Davis was working with. Uh, it was a long time collaborator with Guillermo. Uh, he worked. He was working on this is with us, and he, he was doing this. He did a few a few weeks of drawings with Gamer early on, just to help sell the movie some key frames. Um, and uh, and then later on, when I came when I came on board, I draw on the computer. I draw on a program called SketchUp. It's three three dimensional program. It's very easy easy for me to visualize, help visualize things in three dimensions and at the right scale. And then we can impose textures and, and 
art on top of the on top of that model to give it a little more character. And then often what I would do is I would develop the three dimensional model and give it back to Guy Davis, and then he would paint over top of it in Photoshop to to enliven it and give it give it life per se. And then you know Guillermo was very comfortable. He would come in and we would look through the computer model with me and we'd walk through it all the time and change it quickly on the fly. Um, and so it was a very successful way to get our ideas back and forth. You know, we, we mentioned earlier, we, we talked about Eliza's place and that whole, that whole setup, you know, and, and you mentioned the secret military installation where she works and where the creature was housed um, and, and uh, examined by the government. You know, it struck me uh, as a, uh, you know, intentionally a very big contrast from her place, but also kind of a, an industrial sort of look, you know, th that kind of thing. Was that based on, on any particular references, you know, in, in terms of the you know, the overall look and the colors. I mean, I guess there's the room they called the uh, tank room because they, they kept the creature in the tank. That kind of thing. Uh, did you look at Cold War era movies or vintage photography or any of that stuff? We had a lot of reference from uh, from actually uh, missile, lab, missile sites and NASA things, you know, the early NASA labs and, uh, and early computer, you know, early IBM computer, uh, mainframe computers. Mm -hmm to help influence Strickland's office area. Um, Strickland is the antagonist. Yes, exactly. And uh, also just the architecture. The, like I said, that brutalist architecture was in, heavily involved. Gamma really wanted tiles. The, the, the tiles were important because the tiles were part of this color of the future, this teal green um, uh, color. And we, we went and struggled for quite a while getting the right tone, um, but, it, but then, it, then it, it, it went through the entire uh, lab. Certain things from... Uh, historical pictures, like there was a, those little details, like you might see in the background, it says no loan zone. Uh, basically, it was in, during this Cold War time where you couldn't be alone in some of these labs. You always had to have somebody with you because there was, there was always this idea of, of distrust. And so that was, even though we do have people who are alone in this in this lab, we had that small little thing, details like that in the background. Again, from this research, we start with four weeks of heavy research into the period to set the to ground the, the story at the time. Um, Guillermo, Guillermo's, very, Guillermo's movies are very fantastical and, and stretch, stretch those, the, the reality a lot. But the idea was we wanted to start with uh, a grounding of real 1962 um, to, to help to just, just to sort of settle it and then we can ac accentuate and stylize it all from there. I, mean, I, think if we, I don't think if we didn't start with that, I think we, we could have got fantastical and lost that sort of base feeling. That, that period. And there was another location, it's not featured as much in the movie, but I, I was really struck with it, uh, and, and that is the, uh, the sort of idyllic home of, of, um, of the Strickland character played by Michael Shannon. You know, this is a dark, brooding, troubled, angry man, um, very conservative um, man, and yet he seems to have cloaked himself in the all-American um, home uh, down to the finest little details in the kitchen or, you know, a chair or, or a plate or a fork or everything. Uh, and it really reminded me of commercials and, and, and old, uh, you know, videos I've seen from the 1950s offering like what was then the newest furniture and the newest homes, you know, these tracked homes that people moved into during the big boom in the 50s and all that. What went into uh, figuring out that design? It, it, it struck me as just a, another little touch to to make this whole thing you know everyone has their environment yeah, his environment was, was is kind of that the american dream environment you know with a perfect two two children they didn't have a dog but it, you know they should have had a dog two kids and the, the, the sort of wife who baked or made all this food every day this food from magazines you know it was basically look you know she was showing him mag magazines of these perfect jello you know and that was that little current of that again green jello which is the color of the future Giles is drawing that green jello in his, his apartment. You know, it's those those are all the little links that connect these people, and it, it's that it's that ideal uh, life that you think that he has, but he is this he's a sadistic character, and, and there's all this racism, covert you know, underlying racism and, and uh, or homophobia throughout this whole this whole story, and that's kind of like the, the the contrast. This is the America when America is great again. So everyone looks back to that sort of time period of, you know, this is the future thinking post-war big boom time of America. Yet, in this story, you know, this story is about the underlings, and, or the underdogs, and, and the outcasts, and, and so Guillermo is trying to help illustrate, you know, this 
underlying problems in, in this time period, which is supposed to be that, that America being great time period. Of course, all throughout all these environments and other stuff, uh, you know, there's this fantastic uh, photography from Dan uh, Lauston, um, you know, and as near as I could tell, there was some very cool lighting work done in, in the movie, um, you know, in, a, in her apartment, you know, the aquas and stuff. Um, maybe you could kind of discuss the collaboration uh, with this, with the camera team, uh, with uh, visual effects, you know, to make sure it was all going to come together, to make sure that his light was going to hit your selections the right way, and so forth. Yes, I mean Dan. Dan was a brilliant writer. Uh, I, I mean, he, this this movie is lit in a sort of older way, very contrasty, noir like. Um, never afraid of things going to black, you know. I mean, there's a lot of mystery in black, and, and there's a lot of dark corners in the backgrounds of, of, all, of, of all of the photography. Um, yet we saw pretty much all of it. We saw all of the sets. We, we had lots of conversations about how to light this and what the color should be. You know, his, I might have painted the stuff in, uh, or in her apartment, the aqua colors, but he also lit that side in aqua colors. We had to incorporate lighting from below that would emanate through these floorboards, and, and I... I made it quite difficult for him because I used a, uh, the riser was an existing riser left over from a, you know, to, to help put more money into the, we didn't have a lot of money for this. We had lots and lots of sets. We didn't have a lot of money, but we, we wanted to put it all on screen. So uh, there were some existing risers that were maybe only three feet high and perhaps they were ideally four feet or five feet high for, for Dan to light from below. But, you know, the $50,000 I saved on the riser, I could put it back onto the screen. And we managed to light it anyway. Which we shot for weeks. In three weeks, we shot in these two apartments, and the sun was always going to streak in beautiful, warm light for Guillermo. I mean, for Giles' side, and Eliza's side was always this cool, sort of blue, hot, blue light. It, it, it all had to work together, and still look believable, but be kind of the subtle, subtle change. He, he uh, also, we, we had to work with visual effects for this caustic light. You know, the visual effects created this sort of caustic light pattern, which we, which Dan had to project. Uh, into her apartment for that dry for wet. We also used it in the lab. We had the caustic light shining. I went to incorporate caustic light into the design of the, um, uh, I'll call it the sort of pressurized tank where we see this asset swimming around in like a, you're looking into his fishbowl in a way versus the outdoor pool. And, and we first designed it without a space for that, that projector to be in. And of course, we had to change the design. Had all these pipes on top that we had to modify to absorb a spot for a very large projector to project down to help to help sell that dry for wet. Because inside that tank, there was no real water either. He was The asset was floating. Uh, practical effects had a teeter-totter floating on a... The, the actor was floating on a little teeter-totter. And then there was light smoke. And then visual effects made this caustic light on top of it. Visual effects added bubbles inside there and some particulate in the water and then Dan had to light it light that smoke to look like uh, water and there's quite a lot of layers to help to help uh, to tell <laughs> to help create that look and there's certain things that you know certain locations we went to there's a scene where it was like a howling gale in a sand dunes um, we didn't go outside very often but we went to this one and Dan lit it in such a way it, was, it re really evoked those you know thriller noir, black and white movies from, even though we had color now, there was still not much left. I mean, Guillermo did get some elements of his black and white uh, film in the final of this film. And then there was, um, you mentioned earlier, the uh, the opening scene, which is kind of a fantasy underwater in her apartment. And then later on, she literally wants to experience his environment, uh, the creature's environment with him. He's her lover at this point. Um, and so she floods her bathroom. Um, uh, what was the production design contribution to, to shooting that stuff? I, I don't know if they did tank work or if it was all dry for wet or whatever, but in terms of making the illusion come to life uh, and be romantic and everything you, you guys were going for, you know, uh, what role did you have to play? and collaborating with those other guys, Dan, and the visual effects team and anyone else, special effects, etc. Yeah, that actually is the one set we shot wet for wet. Uh, well, part of it was wet for wet. Uh, and it was a bit of a terrifying thing to shoot. We had, that bathroom was part of the, the main set and, and we shot, there's a scene where Giles arrives and the door is closed and the bathroom in theory is full and there's jets of water spewing out of the, uh, the cracks of the doors. That was a, the special, the practical special effects guys had rigged hoses and, and very narrow um, spray jets coming out of that. When Jaws actually opens the door, there is a small practical dump tank. So we, we did dump water out of there. And then there was rigs 
that would be pouring water down the sides of the uh, um, the remaining bathroom walls. Mr. X, the digital uh, visual effects company, added the bigger dump of water, um, and then but prior to that, we actually had to submerge that set. And prior to that, in the script, we had to submerge that set in the in, in, a, in a tank which we built separately. Um, however, we didn't do that till the very end of the film because um, we were worried about damage to that set. That set had to be built all in aluminum. We didn't use any wood in it for the, the flattish. Uh, and there was no plaster. We used Bondo, auto body Bondo, because it's impervious to the water. The paints had to be tested. They were all, in the end, we ended up using epoxy paint. And the aging we do, the, the, the sets were very, very, very aged in general. And the aging usually would wash off or dissolve or change or contaminate the water for the underwater photography. So we had to do quite a lot of testing with small things just soaked over the weekend in uh, buckets of water to see how they would react. I was terrified that, you know, I had never done a big underwater set before. This was a very tiny underwater set. But I, I, hadn't, I hadn't done one where we did underwater photography. I'd done big flowing rivers and stuff, but nothing shot underwater. So I'd always heard about contamination. Very easy to contaminate the water and you will be unshootable very quickly. So I, we did a lot of stuff to make sure that this wouldn't happen. And I was still terrified. We put the, we had the actor, actress for six hours that day. And by the time we were done, it was just getting a little bit cloudy and she was flying off back to London to shoot Paddington. And we were, had no choice to, no extra time to shoot it. So um, we managed to do it without disaster happening. Another cinematic heroic moment, um, and, and we, we have to wrap up. Uh, but, but before we do, I just I, I wanted to sort of ask you, summarizing some of this stuff. You know, looking at this movie, uh, you know, I saw multi genres. Uh, you're working for uh, an incredible, incredibly visual director. You, uh, you know, you have the whole aqua element um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, maybe you could sort of just give me the overview. Uh, how difficult a challenge was this for you compared to, you know, what you've done in previously in your career? And, you know, and would you learn from working with Guillermo and, and the other guys on, on this show that moving forward is going to make you, you know, better production designer? Well, funny enough, it, it was a very hard shoot for the shooting crew because they were shooting so many nights. But, but for us in the art department, it was actually, we were on the day schedule for the most part. And it was a, kind of a dream project. You know, Guillermo, it's intimidating working for a guy like Guillermo because he, he has a huge appetite for design, but it's also uh, very satisfying and quite easy to work with because he Guillermo brings a lot to the table, so he's already narrowed down the, the number of ideas one has to contemplate for design. You can refine the design much better than if you if you start with someone who doesn't bring uh, some design elements, de design elements to the table. It was uh, very refreshing to have a designer who is so caring and concerned about color um, that I don't think I would ever not do a film without doing a full board early on with the director, or at least trying to get the director to to be on board with the color palette, because those kind of things, if it's established early, the, the role of the designer, it's simplified a lot later. There's less less chance for error. You, you, you've already focused your design, and it's, 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 it's incredible. It's amazing to work for a, a director who appreciates design and really wants to showcase everything as part of his storytelling. Sometimes you build sets that are barely seen. You know, Dan and, and, and Guillermo made sure we used wide lenses. We saw, even if the sets weren't that big, sometimes we'd use a wide lens, we'd see every last piece of it. And all those kind of things are, are, are really um, exciting and, and satisfying, and I'm just thrilled to be able to work on this. Well, it's, it's fascinating stuff, and, and this is definitely a very uh, interesting movie, and, and we wish you a lot of luck with it, Paul, and, and just want to thank you, you know, for taking time to talk to us about Shape of Water. Thank you very much. And that was another Studio Daily podcast from the front lines, my conversation with production designer Paul Osterberry about his design work on Guillermo del Toro's new film, The Shape of Water. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch your inbox every month for more newsletters, directing you to our monthly podcasts covering the art, science, and people involved in the world of feature filmmaking. I'm Michael Goldman. Have a great day.